Okay. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the Bridge Researchers, connecting consensual disease researchers around the world. Okay, today we are going to have Ana Paula Laje with us. I'm going to introduce her very soon. Okay, that's a pleasure, Ana, to be here with you and the group. So before we pass the word to Ana Paula, I would like to just present again one more time, Isaac. Isaac, the Interassistential Service for the Internationalization of Consensology. It's a non-profit organization run by volunteers, formerly uh, within the ICC. Isaac has the status of a pre-consensual centric institution. Okay, so we are here working together to promote the consensology around the world and uh, to have the people understand what is the science and uh, the benefits that you can have from that. Uh, the discussion that we're going to have today is the Bridge Project. Okay? The Bridge Project has been created to bring together researchers of consensuology from all over the world, to facilitate exchange of knowledge and interassistential multidimensional experience. It happens every Sunday of the month it's a free and online lecture where the speaker presents a topic of self-research and then you have some good time for interesting debates. And uh, today, we are going to have Ana Paula Laje with us. She's going to talk about aging with lucidity. It's a pleasure to have you, Ana, one more time. I would like to reinforce it. Ana, started her studies in Consensuology in 1991 in Belo Horizonte, Brazil. She volunteered, started volunteering in Consensuology since 1992 and teaches Consensuology since 1993. Started teaching in Curitiba in south of Brazil and gave classes in many cities in various states in Brazil until 1999. 1999, she moved overseas, lived in five countries, Argentina, Spain, United Kingdom, New Zealand, and Australia, managing office, giving conference, and various courses about consensuology and projectology. She has a degree in psychology, specialist, and MEA in psychology, Gerontology, specialist in cognitive psychology, positive psychology, and human sexuality. So, welcome, Ana Paula, one more time. Okay, hey, <laughs> the floor is yours. Okay, okay. thank it's you. It's always very a pleasure. Much. Thanks for accepting thank this invitation from Isaac. Uh, thank you very much. For me, it's a pleasure being able to be here and talk about this subject. Um, I really uh, would like to thank you and thank you for the participants, the people that uh, took the time to stop and listen to uh, such a subject which uh, is some kind of neglected in our uh, intraphysical life. No, nobody wants to talk about aging, nobody wants to talk about longevity, uh, maybe because it's close to death, I suppose. But anyway, Let's start. Um, before I start, let me uh, introduce you and explain why and uh, I got the interest to study this subject. Um, I've been exposed the past uh, 15 years. Uh, I've been working in different uh, uh, settings and, um, and I was exposed to aging population. In the last 10 years, I worked uh, in a company and I was able, I, I had the opportunity to see and to follow the transitions that people had from workplace to a retirement experience. And uh, it was quite painful for, for everyone, you know, from the psychological point of view. Um, usually the companies, they have a, a, a plan and they, they introduce the person to the transition uh, financially, uh, but they don't introduce the person to the new world that they will have uh, a life. Uh, so when I look at that, I thought, ah, I needed to get better and understand those aspects. And that's why I went to study. And also, I have my mother. She's very, she's 83. 
and uh, it's inevitable when you start to have parents and uh, a family, a close family, and uh, you can see the, they are going through the process of aging. It's inevitable you think about this aging and how to deal with those aspects, and inevitably your own age. And that's uh, another interesting as well. Uh, I start to think, uh, okay, uh, I have a long way to go and I want to live longer. So how am I gonna optimize my intraphysical opportunity, my intraphysical life? Okay, so first of all, um, I would like to ask you guys, uh, we are reinforced in our work in Conscientiality Projectology, the principle of disbelief. So this principle is do not believe in anything, experiment, have your own experience. It's very important that you keep your critical sense. What I'm gonna say here is a result of lots of reading, uh, lots of research, uh, reflection, but uh, in, in any way, it's uh, uh, absolute truth uh, or the, the end of uh, a knowledge. I think this subject or any other subject has always room to uh, grow, to develop more, and um, to look from different perspectives. So uh, it's very important, the critical sense. No? Do not believe in anything. The books, the uh, papers, uh, they accept anything. So it's uh, uh, keep your critical sense, right? So let's start them talking about... Uh, um, uh, are you, Marcelo, are you changing the... I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so, okay, um, I'm gonna look in here. Okay, so um, uh, before the, I start introduce this one, we're gonna be talking about from a paradigm, consensual, um, consensual paradigm, which means the way we are seeing uh, the event of aging is taking into account that we are consciousness in evolution and we are temporarily in a physical body but we have other bodies where we can manifest. And actually the body that ages our physical body. It's the tip of the iceberg. Uh, it's the body that we deal in our day-to-day -day life, but um, it's influenced by all the other bodies as well. So we usually say it's the tip of the iceberg because the way we are performing with this physical body in our day-to-day -day life can show our attributes or our qualifications or our weak traits and the strong traits in dealing with the organization of physical life, okay? And we're gonna see that when we talk about aging, uh, it's inevitable event, we all gonna age. Uh, the difference it is how we gonna get to this uh, time, uh, which is inevitable in our evolution, you know? And how we gonna die as well. In here, I decide not to focus so much in that because we're gonna have Anna next, uh, in our next lecture, she's gonna be talking about the disoma and the process of dying and uh, so on. And I found that I, I will get to up to that point. <laughs> and then she will approach the aspect of dying. So let's see here, what is aging? We're gonna define first the aging and then lucidity. So what is definition of aging? At a biological level, results from the impact of accumulation of a variety of molecular and cellular damage over time, general inflammation of the body. This leads to a gradual decrease in physical and mental capacity, a growing risk for disease and ultimately death. But there is one aspect about aging that uh, these changes, they are neither linear uh, nor consistent. So, uh, and they are only loosely associated with a person's age in years. So what does it mean this? It means that we can find uh, while we have some uh, 70 years old, enjoy extremely good health and functioning. We have another 70 years old, are frail and require significant help from others. So we have a very strong variety of uh, biological response from different people when they are aging. So what is uh, the next one is a definition of our lucidity. So what is lucidity? Lucidity is being aware and having the ability to perceive uh, with clear reasoning and logic without interference what is relevant in each dimension for, uh, of existence or for each moment of our conscientious action. 
always take into account multidimensional manifestation. So I, I actually put uh, the bold what is relevant in each dimension of existence. So lucidity implies our ability to define, to use our discernment, to reason, to use our logic, to see what is the most relevant in this dimension for us? What is important for me in this moment, uh, in this phase of my life? If I'm in this dimension, what is important that I need to look after? If I'm going another dimension, I have a, a, a projection of consciousness, uh, I have lucidity when I understand how I use, how can I use this body? How can I perform my, my, my manifestation out of my body? Which attributes can I enhance to um, increase the experience that I'm having, the quality of that experience. And uh, when we talk about them, the aging, lucid aging means uh, how can we, from the day we were born, because one of the things we're gonna see, we don't, we don't age uh, from one day to another. It's actually a natural process that occurs from the day we were born. Uh, and uh, ar at around 26 years old, we have an invasion of the energy. Instead of the energy come towards our physical body, then we start to go towards our multidimensional bodies. And that's when we start to uh, actually losing, you know, and aging, in a sense, our physical body. And uh, it's important that we understand if our population, uh, 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 someone going to be talking about what's happening in our world uh, in terms of aging population, how can we improve our manifestation? How we can use this physical body and understand the impact the other bodies have in this, the, our emotions have in this body, how we, nowadays, there are lots of information related to that, how our, the food intake I have, my nutrition, uh, the things that I eat will influence in my body and especially in my brain and which kind of situations uh, that I develop my day-to-day -day life that will impact uh, this physical body, and especially the brain. Why we talk about the brain? Because the brain is um, it's the most noble organ we have in our physical body. So we are gonna age, and the longevity is interesting, it's, it's great, but what's the quality of this longevity is gonna be defined for the level of our cognitive attributes, the use of physical body, muscular, muscular response, but also our, uh, our brain, our ability to uh, memory, our memory, our cognition fu functions, um, our ability to reflect or to discern, uh, to change, you know? Uh, to not get stagnated thinking that it's one way of living. So all this will influence how we're going to be aging. So why it's important then we start aging from this point of view, no? We're going to see that um, when we talk about <laughs> Marcelo, <laughs> importance of aging. Okay, so um, why it's important uh, the study of aging? From a personal point of view, uh, uh, if uh, we, uh, please, <laughs> every time that you you want to move to the next slide, okay, we love to hear you. Just let me know that you want to go to the oh, last slide. Right. Next slide. Okay, I'm so sorry. We, we should have organized that before. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. Thank you so much. So, <laughs> well, okay, importance of a aging study. Why it's important for us to Stud. Uh, one thing is, we all gonna age. Uh, if we don't die before our seventies or eighties, anyway, we all we are aging. And it's not only aging; we want to have longevity with quality of life, so productivity. And uh, how can we optimize this experience, having many lives in one life? Uh, we stud in consensuality, you know that. Um, we have an uh, evolutionary uh, experience and we were born and uh, we have an experience and then we have to die and we go to extraphysical dimension, then we return uh, and uh, we have an uh, intraphysical life. And the reason we, why we have an intraphysical life is to work towards uh, improve our manifestation, work with our traits through the control of our, uh, our bodies and also uh, through the use of our energies and the cosmoethics, no? and the inter-assistance. So 
Imagine if we have in one period of life, let's see, 100 years old. Uh, I'm not joking about this because it seems uh, that we have already a person that's going to live 160 years old, according to science. I'm not sure, but uh, they say we have already those consciousness that has reborn. Uh, so and imagine we can use this time intraphysically where we have a physical body, we receive a physical body, and uh, we are actually familiar with this intraphysical body, and we can optimize our existence, and we have many experiences uh, within this intraphysical life, taking advantage of the opportunity to be with a group, with a consciousness that uh, we had this um, encounter with them, and, uh, and optimize our own traits, uh, develop skills uh, and uh, change even our temperament throughout our experiences and yeah? staying in our physical body. So uh, this is why it's so important to study uh, aging. And we're going to see that uh, uh, the study of age started in 1982. And since then, there are lots of researchers. They developed uh, uh, the World, uh, World Organization, Health Organization, the United Nations, uh, all these organizations are putting lots of pressure and improve the quality of uh, aging uh, because it's a very important thing for our planet. And so it's a reality that is we're going to live, people around us are going to live, and we're going to work in the max mechanism of interassistency. We need to understand what's happened with the person uh, that is going through the process of aging. Uh, despite that, we think we know it seems that we don't know, and science is trying to explain more and more from different point of views. And, uh, and we have, it's, uh, it's actually an unprecedented event that humanity is having. And so the max mechanism of interassistency, it's very important because we want to assist those consciousness, no matter where they are, uh, in order to help those consciousness to have really a good intraphysical and productive life, but also to have a productive extra-physical uh, time as well. When they leave this body, uh, detach it from this life and they start uh, opportunity to live a life which is more productive. And uh, so, uh, <laughs> good. <laughs> so let's see, uh, saying that, uh, what we have here, the age in the world. Okay, so as I said, 1982, there were lots of uh, investment and in we start to study uh, about aging. And, uh, and what's happened with our population in general between 2015 and 2050, that's a projection, a proportion. Uh, we're going to have a proportion of uh, a, the world's population over 60 years will nearly double. Uh, from 12% to 22%. So, which means that in 2050, 8% of old people will be living in low and middle income countries. It's interesting we think about this because it's across uh, the board. It's not a privilege only from USA or the, the countries that are more economically developed. Uh, no, we have an uh, increase in the population all around the world. And, uh, and the pace of population age is much faster than in the past. And it's very interesting, a data uh, that I got, which I found fascinating, it is that Brazil, France, uh, it's actually took 100 years for France to deal with those changes. So it is a very steady pace. Uh, Brazil and India in staking 20 years, which means it's a great impact to those countries. Uh, this aging population, what's going to happen with this, um, this reality, no? Uh, and inevitably, uh, this will affect how those countries will work and uh, the policies, the government discussion, and uh, how to include this population. And uh, lots of things will change. I think more and more they will have to change to accommodate this new reality and this new need for the consciousness. Uh, so, why this population actually uh, increase? What's happened uh, around the world that uh, contribute for this um, expectance of life, life expectancy increase, no? So first was a decline from high to low fertility. They are instead increasing the life expectancy at birth and at old age. 
and a shift, that's the important thing. There were a shift in the leading causes of death and illnesses from infectious and parasite uh, disease to non-communicable disease and chronic conditions. What does it mean? Uh, because of the technology, health technology, the improvement of a hygiene, uh, and also the campaign of vac vaccinations uh, that was done throughout the globe, uh, the illnesses, the nature of illnesses changed. So we don't have more people having parasite disease or infectious disease. Now we have people develop a, kind, a, a different kind of uh, disease, uh, which is um, uh, like the non-communicable disease. What are the non-communicable disease? So they are a disease, disease that the person will have a long duration um, and are the result of a combination of genetic, physiological, environmental, and behavior factors. So these non-communicable disease, they are actually disease that uh, they, they are not passed on the other person. We develop those illnesses as a result of our genetic, our physiology, physiological, environmental, and behavior factors. So those are the ones, cancer, no, the cardiovascular disease, uh, it's one, um, cancer, cancers, chronic respiratory disease, and diabetes. So those uh, illnesses, they have been uh, the increase, no, the manifestation of uh, those non-communicable disease uh, throughout the, uh, those last years on no, people. And just for data here, non-communicable disease, they kill 41 million people each year equivalent to seven to one of all the deaths globally. And almost three quarters of uh, the non-communicable disease and 82% of the 16 million people who died prematurely uh, all before reached 70 years old, uh, they occur in low and middle income countries. So we're gonna see that uh, it's quite a, a, an impact in those um, uh, countries. And also in different uh, in countries that are not uh, the low income, but uh, nowadays you see lots of campaign, people talking about those diseases in order to decrease uh, the, the, uh, the occurrence of this. But I would like to call your attention for the aspect that genetic, physiological, environment, and behavioral factors. So there is a component of us taking part of uh, uh, improve our condition in order to not have those, uh, to a certain extent, manifest uh, these illnesses, no? But when, when we talk about the aging, actually, the chronic, you know, the uh, illnesses that are associated with aging, uh, we have some illnesses that can appear as a result of uh, the body aging. And this can appear at the 60, 65, 70s. It depends on the lifestyle of the person, it depends on the variables. Uh, we can't say that the person at the age 65 or 70, she, she, he or she will develop that kind of uh, illnesses. We can't, we can't mention that. But uh, there are some indicators that the body is actually, a, it's actually aging. And uh, we have a hearing loss. Uh, cataractes and uh, refractive errors, um, back and neck pain and uh, osteoarthritis, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, diabetes, depression, dementia. Dementia uh, is one of the most uh, well-known in Alzheimer's. There are lots of studies uh, now focused in the Alzheimer's because we have a great percentage of population uh, in the projections that can develop Alzheimer and uh, already lots of already has those dementia and the Alzheimer's. So it's, uh, but we're gonna see there are uh, many research that shows partially it's actually uh, related to genetic, but partially it is the lifestyle. So uh, we show here the, the, some of those illnesses that the person can develop, but uh, when we go further, uh, if you see uh, what is the result of those research that has been, they are carrying on now with, um, in related to, to, to the healthy you now aging. And uh, what was actually found out, it was genetically, the influence our genetic 
is 20%. Uh, before people would think that ah, I'm going to have this disease because my mom or my dad or my grandma developed that disease. Uh, it's genetic. So um, it's not 20%. And then we have physical and social environments. Uh, and we're going to see how the physical environments where we are can influence uh, the quality of our aging. And the personal characteristics such as sex, ethnic, or uh, economic status. Um, and uh, personality. <laughs> and that's one of the things that we're going to see how uh, the, intra, the, inter, the reality of the intraconsciousness reality, how this will influence on the, how the person will uh, age. You know? And uh, although some of the variations in older people healthy are genetic, much of this, uh, the, what they will uh, have, they are they occur as well the social environment and you're going to see some of the research that has been carried uh, out uh, actually from where they took this information as i said there are many uh, research but this tree stands out for me in a way that we can actually present here uh, and have an idea um, what is that has been said or in investigated no in a sense uh, about uh, this, um, this experience. So the first one is this, the Danish. Uh, I'm going to get here the information about the Danish. Okay. So this, because I have some data, which is important for us to understand. So the Danish twin study was uh, carried in 1999. And the objective of this study was to, uh, the relative influence of genetic and environment factors on self-rated health and hospitalization pattern in the elderly. So they wanted to see how much uh, the, the fact that the person get to the hospital was because of the uh, genetic influence or the environment. So they got, uh, they, they've done a survey among 3,099 Danish uh, twins aged 75 years old uh, and older, and they were identified uh, in the Danish twin register. And uh, what they found from this study, it's uh, actually that the influence uh, on the person's health was uh, based on 20% genetic. That's what I said before. So uh, they observed that approximately uh, a quarter of the variation in the liability to self-reported health and the number of hospitalization could, could be attributed to genetic factors but very, uh, very small in a sense to, of what they were expecting, okay? And uh, this shows a little bit, and now it's one reference that, uh, yes, uh, lifestyle then, and uh, what we said before, the environment where the person lives, the condition where the person lives will influence on the quality of the age the person has. And then we have another one was Dan Butner. It's the zone, uh, the blue zone. If you want, uh, there is a book, if you want to read about this, there is a book on the same uh, title. And uh, the, uh, Don Butner, he was studying. They actually got a pocket of uh, areas uh, they choose five places, uh, not necessarily, it doesn't mean that only those places, they are the places that uh, uh, people are healthier and live longer. They choose this one, okay? We might have others around the globe, but they choose these ones. And what they've done, they, uh, he partnered with uh, a gerontologist, anthropologist, uh, psychologist, and uh, National Geographic. And, uh, and they started to, to see, they were studying areas of the world in which people live exceptionally long lives. And they want to understand why, what are the factors that make these people uh, live longer? And uh, because they live longer and with quality of life. Okay, what are the places? Icaria in Greece, it's an island in Greece. The other one was Ogli Astra in Sardinia. It was uh, in, in Italy, no? And then the other one was Okinawa in Japan. Uh, Nicoya Peninsula in Costa Rica. E, a community, the Seventh Day Adventist in Loma Linda, California. So they got those places and they went there and see what do they do 
that help them to have um, um, a long, longer life. So these places, what they saw, uh, they live 90 and 100 uh, years old. You, you see lots of centenarians in these uh, inactive ones, not inactive ones. Okay, so people are all very uh, ingrained in what they, they are doing there. And one, one thing they, as a result of this research, what they found, it was a common uh, reality among all the places, okay? With some variations, all of them had this as a common manifestation, a common uh, lifestyle. One, they move naturally. They move all the time. They go gardening, uh, they have, uh, they doing housework, uh, they walk, they, they have the, in their lifestyle, it's always incorporate the physical activity. Another one that they observed it is that people, they have a purpose, purpose of life. We talk about existential program, a person has an objective in life. In this case, they saw that, for instance, in Okina, the Okinawans in Japan, uh, they have the Ikigai. Japan has the Ikigai, which is the philosophy of find your uh, sense of life, your objective of life, the things that makes you wake up in the morning and wants to get out the bed and do things, move you know, freely and execute things. And uh, the other ones they found, the Nikoyans, they, they have uh, the idea or the philosophy, which is called plan de vida. No, el plan de vida, which is the plan of life. No, it's the same, more or less the same. Uh, and uh, and they, all of them have this. They all have this uh, interest to have a plan of life. They have something that they are actually uh, want to execute. They have a plan, uh, projects in their lives. Uh, and then one other thing that they saw, they don't shift uh, stress. No, uh, in, in um, let, let's see, yes, they don't shift the stress. So stress is a part of life. It's inevitable. We all stress and so on. And there are many research showing the effect of stress in our physical body, not only in terms of our uh, relaxation, but uh, in our brain and also the absorption of nutrients from our physical body. Like if you are eating and if you are stressed, you tend to, because of the cortisol, you tend to um, not uh, absorb the food uh, properly or you tend to not lose weight. To the contrary, you tend to put on weight. And so they start to see that in these places, people have stress, but they also had uh, ways to relieve the stress, you know, and uh, build in, in, the, in the lifestyle. So the Adventists, they will pray, uh, the Aquarians, they will nap, the Sardinas, they do have powers. So each of them had uh, in their community, in their cities, ways to relieve the stress. In them, they have the 8% rule. What's the 8% rule? Guys, I'm talking about this research because if you, nowadays we get uh, magazines, um, we get uh, articles uh, from different uh, areas, nutritionists, and lot in talking about aging, they refer to these things that come from as a result of those research. And 8% rule, what is 8% rule? They observe that people in blue zones are areas, they stop eating when they are, their stomach are 8% full. So uh, they eat their uh, meals uh, in small portions and, uh, and they eat uh, early in the evening. They don't eat late in the evening. So they have the habit to uh, sleep uh, with the empty, um, the empty stomach. So it's quite interesting, we see the habits. So they have minimalist with their food. They don't actually take this as a, 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 the, the food intake so much. No? It's the opposite we see in many different cultures. Now, the more you eat, the more you uh, sustain your body and so on. So those are the main things that they actually got from there. And uh, the other one, which is Harvard, Harvard uh, uh, research, it was um, actually, it's a research, a longitudinal study that we would review clues to leading health and happy lives. This study is very interesting. They started in 1938. 
Um, and they have during, um, they actually got uh, 268 Harvard uh, sophomores, which are the high school students. Uh, in 1938, uh, during the Great Depression, and they hoped to uh, carry a longitudinal stud, which will give them a clue of happiness. But this stud, uh, it got to another dimension, because since then, 1938, until now, they are uh, still on this, uh, uh, this study. And, um, and it's quite an interesting uh, thing that they actually got the, uh, the, the research, sorry, I have to, uh, just one second. I'm sorry about that. I think I need to put, uh, um, sorry about that. I need to put my, I didn't put my, 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 my computer on the battery. Those things we don't see, but anyway, um, just uh, let me just put it quick here and then we're not going to have a problem. Otherwise I will have a, so I hope you guys are liking. We're going to have a, soon we're going to discuss about these um, questions. No, if you want to have a, no, to have a, to ask some questions, um, it would be great because then we can talk more <laughs> about that's it done okay so during these studies uh, they um actually they found some things quite uh, um interesting and they never expected if you want to have more information about that there is a ted talk with the director which is now known there is one ted talk um his name um i can give you uh his name, Robert Waldinger, uh, and he gave the talk, what, what makes a good life? So lessons from the longe longest uh, study on happiness in 2015, uh, and has been viewed for 13,000 or million people uh, times, okay? So what they found from this study, uh, as they had, uh, pra basically they had 80 years studying these people, and um, it was very big study. And uh, some of them are still alive, 19, and they are, they are in the middle 90s. So they still <laughs> there. And um, one of the things that they found here, uh, first, taking care of your body is important, but tending to your relationship, it's a form of self-care too. Uh, that's one of the things they found very uh, important that they found is that the people who were the most satisfied in their relationship at the age 50 were the healthiest, healthiest at the age of 80. So what they found in this relationship is the importance of our relationships. Uh, so close relationships, more than money uh, or fame, are what keep people happy throughout their lives. Uh, those ties protect people from life discontents and help to delay mental and uh, physical decline. And they are better predictor uh, of long and help life, ha happy lives and social class, uh, them social class, IQ or whatever, no? And uh, so they observed that how the uh, people who has uh, a good relationship, and what I'm saying good relationship, it's not only a affective relationship when people are related, uh, with, um, uh, does it have anything to do with the book? Uh, yes, yes, there is a book about, uh, about this. I'm not sure if you're talking about the, the book, but we're gonna answer and talk about this soon. Uh, so uh, people uh, who are in a relationship, they found mar marital satisfaction has a protective effect on people's mental health. And, um, those who, um, ah, yes, that's the one, exactly. Yes, that's the book, that's his, his book. He's published as a result of this, um, uh, uh, known this research. Uh, and uh, he, 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 they, they saw that people who kept warm relationship uh, got to live longer and happier. And uh, the loneliness, they actually uh, kills. It's more powerful than smoking or alcoholism. So these uh, results that they got here, 
uh, they found one interesting thing as well, which is some of um, our octogenary couples, uh, they could bicker, no? they could fight with each other, but they had that uh, bond with each other, that tie with each other, which was characterized, I know I can count on this person. And that feeling of no, you can count with the person, having that friendship that you trust, uh, that person you can count on, that person that is there for you, this is what makes people uh, healthier you know, when they are aging. That's what they saw here. And another information that I found very interesting to us, that we have the idea that once people, um, they are in a certain way, they're always going to be in a certain way, they found that people uh, used to drink and uh, having uh, uh, cigarettes at the same uh, some time. And uh, at the age of uh, 60s or 40s, they changed their, those habits uh, and they changed their temperament as well. So it's a quite interesting thing that uh, uh, those, they, they had the, the research showing uh, with this research. You know? And so based on this, uh, we're going to see that uh, we get, uh, uh, we get, um, some of the aspects, no, this research actually, it's getting us uh, to understand a little bit more of uh, the aging reality, no? And, uh, but when it comes to a stud aging or longevity, uh, there are four aspects that is quite uh, tricky. And uh, what are those aspects, no? First, to, first one is the diversity in older age. We have all sorts of people uh, all sorts of uh, aging process. As I said before, we have an 80 years old who is very active, is still carrying on with physical activity, uh, intellectual activity, uh, and we have an example. No? We have an example in our study in Concentiology in our CCCI uh, of uh, Professor Wout himself, and we have other teachers in that active mentally physically and they are doing what they need to do uh, very different from other people like uh, sometimes you can see people at their 20s or 40s they are already with uh, diabetes corona disease and the things that uh, they octogenary it doesn't have yet so uh, this variety uh, of stud of uh, aging uh, it actually uh, bring certain challenge because you need to adequate the needs that people have and also how you look those people, you know? uh, And we're gonna see that this will influence the way we think about aging. And this is one of the most important things when it comes to having lucidity about aging, you know? Then the health in inequities. So we have a diversity uh, of um, um, people with different health problems and we have uh, lots of physical and social environments that will impact differently uh, the way that the person develop their illnesses. Uh, so there is a very strong influence uh, between the relationship in the environment and also uh, uh, with the aging. For instance, we have cities, who, uh, sorry, <laughs> we have today cities who, who, which are very friendly to the elderly population. What does it mean being friendly? They have common areas for, for the, the old population. They have a transport where they don't need to jump into the bus. They have access to this transport easier. Uh, they have a, a system of transportation or they have a, a, um, a function in the city that attends uh, and give them autonomy and mobility. And this we're gonna see is very important for the age population to keep their autonomy and mobility. It's very important. Uh, and so this is one aspect. And then we're gonna see the rapidly change your world. Uh, what does it mean that we have globalization, technological development, urbanization, migration, changing all sorts of ch things that's happening. And this is changing the structure in the family. Uh, they structured how people live together or not. Uh, the gender differentiation before um, a few years or in some countries still is like this, but it's changing. It was the function of a woman in the family to look after the elderly, uh, but it's changing. The woman is the work in the workforce. It's actually working uh, and doesn't have the time to do that. 
So all these impact on how the person will change or will age. But the most important one that I would like to stress is the outdated and ageist stereotype, which leads to ageism. So the way we see um, aging, because it's an event, an unprecedented event, we still have lots of myths and preconception in relation to the aging population. And not only, um, um, and I, I'm not going to be able to address the health inequality because otherwise it's a, a whole big theme <laughs> on that. <laughs> but uh, yes, we can have another talk and talk about this because what is and what is actually uh, the World, uh, World Organization, Health Organization, and also the United Nations, they are doing in order to decrease these things. Uh, uh, actually, the decade of 2020 to 2030, they actually put in uh, 10 priorities uh, on, in relation to the study and uh, to work with aging. So uh, let's see uh, some of the myths. You might know other myths, and I would love if you can give some, uh, write to me some other myth that come in your mind, into your mind. I got these ones, but uh, we have lots of uh, a stereotype and myths in relation to age, which is ingrained in our culture. Uh, because we, we all, how we uh, deal with age, we had uh, people living um, in the middle age, uh, they would reach barely 35 years old, they would die of illnesses or war, so they didn't live longer. So now it's unprecedented with the, f the last 50 years, uh, the population is living more and we don't have much of idea and how the elderly, the elderly people are treated, uh, they are invisible they are put aside. Uh, they don't have a uh, power of um, buying, no? Uh, that's the idea, but people are discovering this is in, uh, 60 plus, they actually have uh, ability to use their money and they are consumers. Uh, we don't have some products that are direct for this population, some things to say, no? But okay, let's see. Uh, aging those weeks. So why you aging can create cognitive changes uh, old people, they might perform better in other aspects, you know, one of the intelligences as well. So vocabulary due to the experience, due to the, the learning that they have, so they will develop other abilities, not because the person age that they no longer have the cognitive, they have a cognitive impairment, not everyone. And some, they have more developed other abilities. Uh, aging erases your libido. <laughs> this is very interesting. Uh, it's, um, it's actually taboo to talk about love and sex lives uh, of seniors. Uh, and uh, this is um, it's a stereotype. It's like, oh, okay, uh, after a certain age, they don't uh, need affection. They don't need the sexuality. They don't, need, they don't have a libido. It's all the contrary. And what looks like uh, that people uh, keep uh, why this is damaging because first how the person will think about the age oh my gosh i'm gonna get in our old age i'm not gonna have more libido and also it's a conflict for the elderly population as well there were uh, a document written as a, res a research done at the state of oregon that they found the sexual activity enjoyment do not decrease with age and it's not different from someone who is healthy motivated um, the person has a good uh, relationship um, and uh, they have a, a good lifestyle or, or a health lifestyle, they will want to have sex. Uh, it's not different from the young age. No, if a person is drinking too much, is uh, food, uh, uh, junk food, the person is not exercising, they lose interest in, in, in sex as well. So another one is aging is depressing. And they saw to the contrary as well. And there were actually uh, now COVID, you know, they were thinking that the population, they are the problem. And, uh, and, and, and actually in Argentina, they've done a, a research. Uh, if you are interested, I can give you the data. Uh, but uh, they found out that the, the elderly at home, they are uh, reinventing themselves mentally they are actually reinventing themselves they are adapting to this situation where they are 
uh, they are not necessarily depressing. No, they are actually inventing. They start to use more the telephones. They are using the iPads if they have. Uh, they are find ways to entertain themselves. And it's quite interesting because we would think, oh, they are lonely. Other thing, aging leads to loneliness. Not necessarily uh, if the person has restriction mobility, might be. But uh, most of the seniors, they have contact with each other. They attempt to have those contacts. And this uh, loneliness not necessarily has relation. Obviously, there is a struggle in the city, but sometimes the, 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 the person, the person themselves, they, they don't have the motivation to interact with other people, uh, to discover new bonds, to discover new ties, no? And uh, so, uh, in another one, it's making uh, make, uh, you less creative, not at all. Um, there are lots of, um, and actually American artist, uh, Grandma Moses, uh, who held her first one woman art show in 1940, uh, when she was 80. And she continues to do that until 101. We have many writers in Brazil. We have Conceição Evaristo, who started to write at the age of 50. So people are active, you know. Uh, and uh, age makes you more religion, not necessarily. This is generational. If the person was going to the church every day, so they will carry on going to the church. Age, age makes you uh, unable to adapt to new situations. I saw before we talked about this, no? Adapt to new situations is an ability that uh, obviously the, the more the person has experience, more flexible. If they are flexible, they will probably will be able to adapt. Uh, and the last one, but not least, aging makes you unproductive. This is a system, not necessarily. Exactly, exactly. So all these myths and the stereotypes, they actually are in, uh, influenced by the culture where the person is. Uh, if we change, here I'm giving a general uh, idea, but if we go from one culture to another, we're going to see a very big difference. Uh, in Brazil, uh, some stereotypes are more related to the image. Some has no the loneliness, obviously the bidu and so on. Uh, and uh, yes, it's influenced by the whole structure of our culture, our social system, our health system. But it permeates as well. So sometimes uh, the ageism actually creates the preconception, and people actually. Uh, they are harmful. They they actually very harmful for the elderly for the elderly population. Why they feel excluded, and uh, why it's so important to study these things? Because first, how we gonna age define um, will be defined by how we think about aging, and secondly, how we treat the other person will be defined on how we understand the process of aging. No, we can look at the other person and see, oh, you are uh, an old whingy, uh, stop whingy, uh, you are gaga. Uh, I don't know how to translate this in English, but, <laughs> you know, you are crook. I don't know the word, but uh, uh, the person is old and talk too much. And it's nothing like this. It's individual. Ah, and there is another one. You age and you turn into child. Since when? When are you going to waste that experience the person had in life and turn them into a child? Never. No, uh, we need to remember. And uh, I think this is, uh, that's why I put uh, uh, the next uh, uh, here. Um, let's see here. Uh, we need, uh, yes, we need to understand due to our diversity, social, cultural diversity, our uh, uh, the places, the culture where we are, our conditions, social cultural conditions, and also how we ourselves deal with our lives, we reflect that we have several aging styles. No? And I put here, uh, we have a lady in India uh, learning to deal with a computer, and we have the Africans in the community, we have maybe in Af America or Sweden, or all of them studying uh, in a library with the computer. We have a group here of uh, the aging, uh, the elderly with uh, tattoos, no? And they, they've done, and what's happened is, no? They could have had tattoos while they're elders. Yes, I'm gonna talk about this very soon. Uh, and then we have people very active. Uh, in here, the base here on your left, it's a lady, she is 117 years old. 
uh, there is two photo, there are two photos of her uh, one that's young and she's older she's japanese uh, she's 116 so you have here the affection and so on and then the uh, in the next one you're gonna see the next uh, uh, part other types of aging as well now you're gonna see the people at the uh, long-term uh, residence, longer term residence, and we have here. This, I suppose, is a type of uh, a type of uh, community, you no, know, a residence that they are developing now, which has a different uh, structure. It's uh, common now in Danish. Uh, some part, some countries they are developing this. It's quite interesting. And then you see here the lady. Uh, she's playing. Uh, guitar and uh, her daughter or her grandma, uh, gra uh, granddaughter is doing the swing <laughs> and uh, and I couldn't uh, leave the Bayana, no? With, uh, they usually have this great smile when they dance and do the akaraje. And, uh, so why I'm putting this? Because we need to understand that people are singular. Uh, there is no mass, massified response on aging. When we deal with a person that's aging, we need to put that understand that aspect. Uh, okay, so, um, and uh, let's, uh, yes. So, uh, and then with this uh, stereotype, we talked about this, no? Uh, we overlook it for employment. They are restricted from social service, uh, stereotype in the media. Age is marginalized and exclude old people in their community. We have a big example of ages when uh, in Italy uh, in Europe, they had to choose between an older, elderly person or a young person to live. Uh, this was terrible because you see who you're gonna, <laughs> how you're gonna make this choice. No? You play God in a very discriminative way to a certain extent. No? And this is important we talk about this because this actually contribute uh, its harmful effect for the person. No? And um, sometimes, because of this, people don't include the aging population. And if we are aged, the better place for us to age is close to the like-minded, close to the people that uh, uh, we have things in common and where we feel safe, we feel respected, we feel included. And, uh, and with ageism, it is, doesn't happen. In cultures, there are cultures that has more conscious this and other cultures, not at all. Uh, sometimes they call the, the elderly, oh, uh, grandma or grandpa. No, you have one grandma. <laughs> you know, people think, ah, it's nice, but it's not. You have in front of you someone that has an experience and how you treat that person with dignity. You know? And uh, it's actually within the human rights you know, to give that person dignity and autonomy to live. Okay, so uh, I'm... Uh, Old gizards. Ah, that's another word. Ah, I'm gonna take these these words, which is quite a. Uh, it's a, a diminished. The di, diminished. Uh, they diminish. They put that person down. No, it's quite a bully. No, demini exactly. Thank you. Uh, yes, the Western culture has this focus. Soon we're gonna see what is happening with the other side. Okay, so let's, uh, we're gonna talk, uh, this, um, this I'm gonna put here, it's a list where um, it's something that we've been studying, I've been studying, the person that developed this idea is Graciela Zarebski. Uh, she actually uh, brought this, the aging, uh, the protective aging factor. Uh, this ha has relation with our interconsensuality, postures that we can develop that will protect us from uh, an aging uh, where we're going to have lots of mental problems or uh, we actually anticipate our death. Okay, so will, willingness, willingness to change. So the past is open to change. They, they actually open to the idea of changing, uh, to live uh, new things, to experience new things. And this can start from, uh, I always bought bread in this place. Okay, let's try to buy bread in another place. All this we're gonna see will work and help the plasticity of our brain. The brain plasticity has relation with uh, the ability that we heal our own brain, no? the flexibility. And this shows in how we act uh, towards sink. Another one, self-care questioning. Uh, the person be able to question themselves and to question their 
project, their goals, if something didn't happen from one point, will grab from another point, you know? Uh, uh, having flexibility to question themselves and see, okay, um, uh, I have this project, but how can I adapt? Maybe you won't be able to do right now. Uh, I, I can change, I can in, in observe my own uh, limitations and so on. And then we have uh, capacity of self-inquiry, reflection and waiting. This has relation of, uh, uh, it's related to self-question, but it's actually being able to come out from that position that we had throughout our life. Uh, kind of a ego, né? I, I am the judge or I am a model, or I've been, I am, a, the person has that position. And uh, with aging, we, things will change. Uh, we're gonna have to change some of the, the manifestations we have. And so this ability to question ourselves and that idea, I am, I am, <laughs> no? uh, and having more flexibility in this way, this will help. Psychic wealth and creativity, uh, have an internal world, which means uh, to deal with the situations, have creativity to uh, deal with a loss, to have uh, creativity to deal with some of the impairments that inevitably people are gonna, gonna have. Uh, this will help like dealing with the losses, uh, leaving the loss, but, at, uh, but inside having that capacity to um, turn that in favor of one. No, uh, then the empty losses and compensation with property. What is this? Um, sometimes you have to have uh, to wear a part of glass, or you have to wear a crutch, or you have to put the auriculars, no, because your you can't hear well. So all these, it's part of the the losses we're gonna live, or you lose uh, your partner. Uh, we no think that's never gonna happen, and how we make the best of this in turn and to adapt to that new reality. Another thing is self-care and autonomy. Uh, make one as accountable for their own self-care. And this is the principle of disbelief is quite good because the person goes to the doctor, the doctor, I will feel this, I will give you this past you or that. And the person will, oh, oh no, 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 I will, I will try in other ways, no? And also autonomy. Don't uh, put the, person, the other person responsibility of what is my life. No? And uh, in some cultures, this is stronger than others, but uh, it happened. No? That person think, ah, because I'm old now, someone else has to look after me. Uh, and this doesn't happen because it doesn't help. Uh, the person doesn't, uh, it's not proactive in making their lives better. Uh, anticipate position with respect to the age. Uh, it's very interesting because um, it's like look around and see that people are aging and how we mirror that. Some people just don't want to see. They don't want to listen. They don't want to see the frailty of the physical body. No, uh, le live, live there. And they are not anticipate the aging. And also anticipate the finitude, no? uh, the position with respect to finitude. We all gonna die, that's certainty. How do we deal with this? Do we have our, um, statement it's a statement uh do we have uh, our accounts or our life organized for that uh do we think about this do we have a power of attorney where we discussed and say what i would like to happen when i am uh dying obviously some countries they they will exactly thank you jacqueline uh so do we have that in place do we have you have we show, uh, talked with our family what we want to happen with our body we donate uh what we're gonna do no advanced directives exactly do we have that in place so this is actually anticipated with respect to our finitude in the general times what does it mean do i have a good relationship with people younger than me or do i think that i i don't have anything in common with these people what i'm gonna learn from them or what they're gonna relate to me intergenerational ties it helps us to rejuvenate and to keep alive motivated refreshed in our approach towards life do we have a diversification of ties and the interest which means or uh, do i have only my husband or my partner uh, or my, my husband or my wife that i relate and i rely or i have a, a range of friends 
from all different backgrounds and I exercise this affection from different uh, uh, perspectives, no? Uh, the diversity uh, of uh, relations that will enrich even my psych psychic wealth, no? My affectivity and so on. Interest, or do I have, how, how many things do I have as a hobby or things that I like to do or things that I, I'm tight on, no? To, to like to develop and so on. And uh, so this is one thing I passed uh, quick, but maybe in another talk, we can talk more about this. That's the base of the work I'm doing. Uh, that's how we work with people. But just to finish here, I have a special interest in Japan, uh, especially because of the aging population. I've been there a few times and uh, Japan, um, it's the, nowadays it's the country with the greatest number of uh, centenarians. And uh, I, they, apart from Ikigai, they have this weak sabi, which is a Japanese philosophy. And uh, I think this plays a big role on how they deal with aging and how they do deal with life in general. So wabi-sabi, it's a way of living that focus on finding beauty within the imperfections of, um, or, of life and accepting peacefully uh, the natural cycle of growth and decay. So uh, this, you see here, the side here, we have uh, uh, actually it's art um, that they called, uh, um, let me see here the name, Katsuji art. The Katsuji art, it is, they have actually, it's a, it's a representation of this philosophy. What I'm talking about this philosophy is kind of uh, superficial because uh, despite that I've read, there are some things that uh, uh, you need, it's ingrained in the culture, you need to understand more. But basically it is the example here, it's, um, uh, it's a creativity based on the wax sabi, and where there is a cracked pottery and it's filled with gold dusted lacquer as a way to showcase the beauty of its age and the damage rather than hiding it. It's, it's the principle of what is all about wakasabi. So waki express the part of simplicity, impermanence, flaws, and imperfection. And sabi displays and express the effect that time has on a substance uh, or any object. So together, wabi-sabi embraces the idea of an aesthetic appreciation of aging, flaws, and the beauty of the effect of time and imperfections. It's all about build, uh, it's uh, actually accepting yourself and building on what you already have in life. So that's, if you understand in terms of aging, so you value what you have in your life. You just rebuild some things. You just make some different projects, some different choices. You reinvent yourself. Uh, in Wasabi Day actually prizes authenticity. It's different kind of looking no, a different kind of mindset. Uh, it's the true acceptance of find beauty in things as they are. Very different. Someone talked about the Western and uh, Eastern society. It's very different. Uh, here we want to hide uh, everything that is uh, not beautiful. No, we age the wrinkles. We want to go and uh, do a plastic surgery. We want to uh, hide everything that uh, reminds us remotely that we're getting older and that is different no? and uh, so this uh, just then for us to finish uh, our presentation professor how to talk about uh, the lucidity self-lucidity uh, and uh, I think is that the important thing um, the lucid aging uh, is it is um, one more the lucid aging it is not a common disease and even early the soma. But for the self-organized intraphysical consciousness can be the best phase of their human existence. The self-lucidity is the essence of well, wealth, uh, well-being. So uh, I actually showed that and uh, I think self-lucidity, it's uh, based on our ability to have discernment and to question our own absolute truth uh, and the focus, and here now multidimensionally, do not, not losing the perspective, the perspective that we are conscious in evolution, 
but understand that we are in this dimension and uh, the way we treat our physical body can actually help us to stay longer and take the best of this our existence or just will uh, shorten our opportunity, unique opportunity that we have at least at the moment. No? So that's uh, the presentation I would like to talk. Uh, and I hope uh, if you guys like, I was talking with Marcelo later, we can talk about other things. So we have still some time for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Ana you. Paula. Thank you. It was great. I, I missed some uh, slight transition. Sorry for that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but let, let's open for the questions from the group. Okay. We had a couple great. of them during great. the meeting on the chat, but uh, uh -huh. feel free to open your microphone and uh, just. Uh, yeah, the comments. Uh, yes, yeah. any comments, so everything, Any comment, questions, everything. To, the, yeah. the, the one thing that I would like to, to mention before going to the next question, it's about, I think that there is a special meaning on this self-lucidity uh, definition from Dr. Valdo because it was from 2014. Mm -hmm. Okay, his the summer was in 2015, so he was the example that we can be productive and uh, creative and uh, working with the assistance towards the end. I think that's uh, it's uh, again uh, going through the example. And uh, also, he is a strong advocate for about the health of physical body. I remember in the 90s. Uh, now, Professor Valdo is talking about the walk, uh, uh, trade meals, uh, the juices, and uh, you know that we, you should take the multivitamin. Uh, so he always put his attention in this aspect. Anna asked to retrieve some uh, slide. Is this one? Next. Uh, okay. This one. Yes, I, I suppose. Is this one? Anna? Yes. So in here, it talks about uh, the essence of the philosophy. No, uh, it's actually a. In Japan, there are some uh, the aesthetics. So you see a lot in architecture, you see in the food, you see how they behave themselves. Wabi-sabi has relationship with uh, Buddhism. Uh, so, but uh, how they implement this in their day-to-day -day life, it's amazing. It's, uh, uh, there are gardens that they have such a simplicity. They are extremely complex in how they build the garden, but uh, they present as very simple. There are some architectures, some temples, they are extremely simple, but extremely complex. And the, one of the things, the wasabi uh, philosophy, it is it's not, uh, you don't need to make, that are comp uh, to make things uh, that are complex, complex. You can go from a complex situation, complex thing, and put very simple. You know? And, uh, and they talk about presentations and talk, sometimes we use lots of composite, in our presentation, it's more like it should show off that I know, but uh, in reality, we can give the information a simplicity that people can understand and appreciate the beauty of that. Yeah, and Anna, I would like to, to ask you to talk a little bit more about one of the subjects that you covered in the beginning of the presentation, because yeah. uh, I think that everywhere but also inside consensuology uh, uh, groups okay it it's important and you show that like uh, some of the disease longevity it's like a 20 percent is genetic and that yes. is 80 percent of disease that they sometimes they are silent killers mm -hmm. so preventive care exams that's very important and sometimes some people doesn't okay take a good care of you or, or himself yes. herself that's all about self assistance yes and this is actually it's our responsibility it's the self care no um, sometimes and uh, i i can see that and i've seen that throughout many years that we we dedicate ourselves to inter assistance i assist to assist but we forget 
to address our own assistance, our responsibility with our physical body. So not only the periodics, now the, the exams we do, but with our food, as the years change, it's important to review what we are eating. Nowadays, we have a strong, extreme, uh, great um, literature in information on uh, sugar, uh, how sugar is harmful for us and now to, even for our, our brain. And there is one um, a doctor that actually, uh, he, he talks about, uh, and I'm going to just finish that and I will go back there. He talks about how the lifestyle, uh, the in food, uh, the type of food we eat can actually contribute to the Alzheimer, you know, and the, the sugar and so on. And uh, I agree with you. I think it's, uh, it's a responsibility that we have. It's ours to keep ourselves uh, healthier, motivated, even with the energy. If I am ill, if I uh, am not eating well, if I have a sectarian, uh, sectarian, uh, if I don't exercise, I'm overweight. Sedentary. Uh, yep. Sedentary life, exactly. Sedentary as well. It's contributes the same way to the illness. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> but <laughs> but uh, if I have uh, this situation, what's happened? I'm going to prevent myself to, be, uh, to perform uh, in an uh, assistential activity. You know? And so we can't, uh, and this is, uh, I think, to a certain extent, it's passed on religion aspect because uh, it's a sacrifice of ourselves that comes with purity. But now we can't deal with this. It's, it's our responsibility to deal with our body and not sacrifice our physical body uh, in name to do the assistance because otherwise we're not gonna have energy to do this and perform in a good way. So preventive, uh, and you see, uh, you got it very interesting because those are illnesses that you can prevent. You can prevent. Unless you are in a very poor country that you don't have resource, you can't have the doctor, no, the bad doctor there. You can, unless you are in this situation. But nowadays, we can prevent this. Uh, and it's our responsibility. No? And uh, the periodics, uh, go to a nutritionist, go to a physiotherapist. Uh, we are having some problem in pain. Our pain is natural. No, it's not. It's the way that the body is telling you there is something need to be done with our physical body. You know? And so this is something that it's important what you say. Yes. Uh, Anna, she actually, she asked something. Yes. How do you contrast the Vabi Sabi philo philosophy with the concept of uh, energetic rubbish? Okay. Okay, excellent. Uh, energetic rubbish. It's, uh, what is energetic rubbish? It's when we hold objects that are unnecessary. No? The Wabsabi actually uh, puts the minimalism. If you go to places in Japan, it's very rare you're going to see pl places cluttered, cluttered and full of stuff. They have the necessary thing that they need to use. And this is probably based on that. They have the philosophy of minimalism. Uh, the energetic trash, it actually can be a holder for us. There are some people due to the tra uh, tra uh, tra uh, traumas that they have throughout their lives. They develop what we call the holders. They actually hold objects. Uh, they hold uh, not only objects, but they hold memories. They hold, and there is a, book, a great book on, on that, which is the Antibagulism Energetic de Katia, Katia Arakaki. Uh, it, it's very interesting because when I talk about aging and I think about age, I think about that book. Uh, it's a clean, it's a clean for our own holotoceni, our own um, uh, ideas, uh, the object that no longer necessary, having a house that it is what we need to have there. And then uh, what's that? Wab Wabsabi, it's actually talk about this. You have a garden. Uh, based on this philosophy, it has the essential. Aesthetically, you look, it looks uh, empty, but it's not. It has the essential for the aesthetic, for appreciate that uh, environment. And they take this to their home. You know, you, the Japanese people, they have uh, their home very organized, optimized, practical. Uh, it's not a, a house like um, lots of Americans, I think, have like this, but it's not privilege of Americans. Uh, Australians and they have their house full of stuff. Uh, so no, not at all. Okay, especially war. Yes, the war, Melanie. Yes, the war. It's uh, 
traumatic, uh, the traumas that they have, war, uh, uh, big losses no, that they have. Uh, this uh, makes people hold people that had uh, participated at the Second World War, but not necessarily they went to the war, but they suffer the consequence of war. Some people start to hold, hold. They, they, they fear hunger, they fear losing things. But deep inside, it's an emotional thing. No, it's a kind of holding memories or energies that the person needs to uh, survive. No? And uh, when we talk about the aging, it's important we apply the simplicity, the minimalism, we let it go. Uh, being able to disattach from material things and also from our physical body. No? Well, because if we talk about multidimensionality, there are people that they die, but they still carry on linked with their body. Here we see ah, uh, someone, uh, Marcel, someone uh, made a comment. I think it was Anna. Yeah. Yes, it was Anna. Here we see holders like no other countries. Yes, yes. And uh, we see in America as well uh, overweight people. No? Despite that we have so many information, we have overweight people there as well. And so this uh, it shows uh, a pathology in the society because when it happens, these things, the, the capitalism plays a big role, the marketing, obviously, because it works with what people, uh, their needs, their deep needs, and so people are more vulnerable to that. And uh, you see uh, the food, no? you, you, you buy, the less you buy, the more you eat. And it's the opposite of uh, what asab, wasabi is. Wasabi is a philosophy that the less, it's more. <laughs> Not the more is less. Uh, it's less, it's more. Less food, it's all right. The less uh, things you have in your right, it's all right. The less clothing, stuff you have, it's better. You know? And so it is something that we see. Uh, and in, in relation to the aging, the longer the person is in this condition, in some cases, they have a high level of anxiety and uh, they need to go through uh, a therapy and uh, assistance or even medication. But uh, I like to study hold, but in, in degrees up to us, what we hold, what are the things that we don't let it go? Now, even in studying conscientiology, projectiology, we study, we apply this in our lives, but what we are still holding? What are the memories? What are the emotions we still hold? What are the objects we hold that could be passed on? Uh, and what, what sorry, they, throw, they talk about is you pass on what you have. The object has a function. You, you are grateful to that. And once they don't no longer have a use, you pass on. No? And we should do that with the body. No? Uh, now, no longer, what can I donate and, uh, and go and move on? Uh, and sometimes won't happen that people get uh, stuck. Yeah, and uh, Ana Paula, we have another comment here from Ana Yogan that it's, uh, it was left behind. Nowadays, aging is related with epigenetics, interaction between genetics, environment, and lifestyle. And, yes. and then the late introduced the idea of para-epigenetics in his recent course, Paragenetics. Yes, yes. And so it's expanding this idea because what's happened, the science, conventional science, is why they don't accept the multidimensionality, multidimensionality with the physical quantum. They are starting to come to terms with some of the aspects that will help us to understand deeper. And uh, these uh, things I exposed here, we still have lots of things to, um, to research. Uh, in conscientiology, we need to research uh, the process of aging. I think uh, uh, this will change. I'm, I'm actually starting to flying around, but uh, we'll change the concept of our intensive course, the time and everything will change. I don't know. How can we improve the motivation of people staying in this dimension longer? You talk with people and they say, no, no, I want to be out of here as soon as possible. <laughs> no? And uh, so there are lots of things that we need to optimize. And the epigenetic is coming to optimize our physical body. Yeah. No, to, to improve that. That's why I said that uh, some scientists says that uh, we already have the person who's going to live 160, uh, 60, 160 years. Yeah. Uh, I think Melanie talked about something organic. 
Uh, it was Jack. In the US, you can buy a few organic products or get a few fast food meals for the same price. So capitalist society definitely plays a role. Yes, definitely. And also the discernment, because people have a high uh, condition, some, no, to buy. And uh, you need to discern. You come into a, a supermarket where you have yeah. this range and you have to choose, no? And so in society, yes, uh, marketing, yes, but uh, the discernment, that's why the self-lucidity is important. The discernment the vessel has. No, this will, it has a value, nutritional value for me or not. Yeah, and then Melanie continues with the organic comments here. I, I think it also depends on countryside versus city. Even in Europe, it's more difficult to buy organic things in big cities and more expensive compared to the countryside where farmers are direct providers to the regional community. Yes, probably, probably. The demand as well, no? And people where they have the culture. And besides that, Europe doesn't have much of space, green space, no? And if they do a culture of the organic, uh, there are so many demands to create an organic soil. They can't do near the, the, the big cities, no? They have to go far. And the transport and everything will influence. In Australia, we can buy these things. It's quite interesting. We can buy and access not only organic food, but we can supplement a range of supplements as well. I didn't talk much about supplement, but it's another thing as well. Yeah. Simone yeah. asked something. Yeah. Uh, can you please talk about the lack of or uh, the excess of care and intrusion and also the relationship between eating habits, carbs and or protein or excessive excessive eating and the intrusion as we okay okay so, so uh, the all these the habits no the habits we have and everything uh, as well it's defined as well yeah <laughs> uh, we define by ourselves we have the habits and we define by who we are and the, everything uh, but once we do that we connect with a whole range of conscious that they they have their uh, habit habit and uh, it uh, bring to the person emotional satisfaction. There, is, there are two types of eating. Eating because your body needs, and usually the body doesn't need much. We saw 8%, you can be half and you are satisfied if you eat the good nutrients, the important nutrients that you need to have. And there is another type of food which is emotional. So in reality, I'm not eating the food. I'm actually uh, using the food to uh, to tap, to block a hole in myself, a dissatisfaction, an emotional dissatisfaction. And in this case, that can lead to a self-intrusion. It's a self-intrusion that leads a few avoid. Is that exactly, Anna? You feel a void. You actually want to feel something there or rejection or abandon, or whatever it is that in your intraconsciality is there. And it's automatic. You go, it's anxiety. You go automatic. So you attract consciousness to you that has the same pattern. And you, you're going to carry on doing that. It can be with alcohol. It can be with the food. It can be with the chocolate, which becomes an addiction. Uh, and carbohydrates. So when we eat carbohydrates, there are some uh, 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 neurochemical activities in our body that the more you eat carbohydrates, they turn into a sugar, the more you want to eat. And so you actually create in your body the, that lack or that need in your body as well. And so you start to have more need to eat better. Uh, in terms of diet, protein, nowadays there are a variety. What I think is each person needs to see what is the best for me. A quantity of food uh, now talks a lot about uh, fasting intermittent fasting, the person needs to see, is that all right for me and so on, but always using the critical sense, because it's not because one uh, diet, uh, it's good for everybody, it's good for me. Uh, I react personally, I react better when I eat certain kind of uh, protein in a certain time. Uh, I can see, I can hear my body, do, uh, you know, you are related with your body, you see that. Uh, carbohydrate, I, I can see how they uh, out my digestion and uh, uh, I feel more sleep, I don't think much, but a food, uh, just finish here, no? A balanced uh, nutrition where we have 
all the micronutrients necessary for our body, where we balance our uh, bowels, uh, we have our bi microbiotic uh, in our intestine uh, balanced. This will help us associate with physical activity uh, and so on. This will help us to have more energy in our manifestation with our body and to have more uh, muscles or lose the weight that extra. And one more thing, just to finish, we live in a dimension that uh, it's an energetic dimension, denser, which it leads us to energia. If, if our body already has the energia, which means we, are, we don't eat, we are couch potato, no? we sit there and uh, we eat to do on one side and look at television on the other, uh, this it's, it's actually abort <laughs> the possibility of having a healthy body to do the task we need to do. So, uh, Ana Paula has yes. been wonderful. Uh, I, we are getting close to the end of our presentation. I think that Thank Renato you. wants to make, I think, the last comment or last question. Yes. Yeah. Great. So, Thank you. Yeah. I just want to comment something here. They ask me all the time, uh, what do I do regarding my uh, food intake? Because I'm almost uh, 50 years old and then I, I'm very active, right? And what I say is what I eat is not the most important thing. What I do not eat, it's what makes the difference. Yes, yes. Right? And like I don't eat sugar, carbohydrates, and I can make a list of a different things that I don't eat, like uh, industrialized uh, food and everything. But what I don't eat, it's what makes a huge difference in my uh, lifestyle, I guess. Yes, and you go for the elimination of the things that doesn't, uh, you Just don't care. feel good about this, no? Yep. And when we are talking about the aging, it's the body, what we do with our body, in physical activity and uh, in our nutrition as well. But there is one other aspect very important that we can't dismiss or we, we didn't talk much here. It's our sanity. It's yep. what we think, uh, the thoughts we produce and how this impacting other people and impacting ourselves and this is self lucidity. This will create blockage in our energetic body, which reflects in our physical body, and mm -hmm. blockage you know, in a sense that we and the way we think with the mindset and so on. And uh, so yes, and this will actually contribute for what Simone said, where the person don't change their uh, habits. They, they, they don't use their abilities, cognitive abilities to change their habits because they are immersed in that holotocene of uh, whatever it is that they created. Okay. So, uh, Ana Paula, one more time, I would like to thank you and I would like to uh, leave an invitation for the group, okay? First, wonderful presentation. Everybody appreciate it. And I would like to invite everybody that's here on this call for the presentation and debate with Anna Yogan on October 4th about grief and dying. We are going to talk about the Dissoma. <laughs> Anna, we are waiting for you next week. <laughs> Great, Anna. I look forward for you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you all. Guys. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.